Um, doesn't look like anyone lingering. Uh, so today, uh, little change in plans for those of you who may have saw the poster. Uh, Shelly is under the weather, pun intended. Um, so we have David Hayes here to talk uh, about processing higher resolution satellite data and stuff. Uh, so David Hayes is a software developer in SSCC at the University of Wisconsin Madison. At SSCC, David works on projects varying from low-level meteorological instrument data management to, to developing high-level tools to assist scientists in their research and analysis. Over the years, the software development work has brought David to join multiple open source software groups, including Software Carbon Tree, PyTroll, Pangeo, and VizPy. This work and participation in scientific Python community has resulted in David becoming a core developer on libraries like SatPy, FireSample, VizPy, and others. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm Dave. Uh, we're going to talk about SatPy today. So this is a Python library um, to help you work with satellite data. Um, I'm going to be focusing on imagery data today. Um, I will confess that a lot of these slides are from a talk I did at the AMS Satellite Conference, but that was a 10-minute talk. This is what I wanted to say if I had time then, and so I do have time now. Um, so, uh, overview of what was already said. Um, I work on the sixth floor, so if you have any questions after this, you come up with something later, come talk to me. Otherwise, um, my email's on the last slide too. I am a core developer on the PyTroll group, so that's an open source community. Um, we make various Python packages and tools. Um, SatPy is one of those, so I'm a core developer on that, help that community, it's an international community. A lot of members live in Europe. I'm one of the few US developers, so if you want to join, it'd be great. Um, and yeah, I contribute to other open source projects as well. This talk is split up into two parts, the what, the what is SatPy, what can you do with it, and then the how, where I talk about how some of our users and contributors are actually using SatPy, give you some ideas of what you could do with it, um, and how you might apply it to your own work. So we're going to be talking about mostly imagery data in this talk. Um, when you are working with imagery data, there is a lot of things you might want to do with it, maybe making pretty pictures, some RGDs, um, you might be using Beers data, like the data on the left, or ABI data, like on the right, or any number of other satellites. When you make RGBs like this, there's a lot that goes into making these. You have to read the files, you have to, you might want to apply certain atmospheric corrections, like Rayleigh correction. You might want to do some sharpening techniques to get the best possible picture you want, or you, you can get. Um, in the case of polar data, you often have to resample that data, so you have flat lawn points, you want to project it onto some map. Um, so there's a lot of complicated steps going into this. If you didn't want to make an RGB image, maybe you wanted to work with the individual bands of a satellite. So here are the 16 channels from ABI. Maybe you want to make images of them, but maybe you want to actually pass that data off to your own processing, your own analysis. Um, so there's things that go into that as well. You still have to read the files, but you might have to calibrate the data, you have to worry about missing values. And all of that changes depending on what file format you're reading, what, um, what instrument you're working with, what platform sometimes, what year the file was generated, what flags were used when somebody ran that processing to generate those files. There's just a lot of complexity that can end up being involved just to use satellite data. That's where SatPy comes in. I have a couple slides with Python code. If you don't know Python, hopefully it's understandable because that's kind of the point of SatPy. Um, in SatPy, we start with importing the scene object. This is really our main actor in Python. It's how we interface with all of the functionality that SatPy has. Uh, if we wanted to do some basic things like reading channel one from some API data, I can create the scene object. I tell it what format my files are in, and I give it some files. What Sapphire is doing under the hood there is it's going through all the files, figuring out what you gave it, does it know how to read those files, and then figuring out what's available from those files. We can then ask the scene, 
what data sets are available from these files, so channel 1 through 16 in this case, because that's what I gave it. If I want to actually load the data and work with it, I can use this load method and pass it one or more channels that I want to load, so in this case channel 1. What SatPy is doing there is it's going to the files, reading all those files, doing the calibration to get it from radiances to brightness temperatures, it's handling missing values, um, all of that complexity that I talked about with working with uh, the channel data. Then, if I want to actually see that data, oh, I should have mentioned, in the load call it's also where it, um, getting all of the metadata for that channel, so standard name, units, that kind of thing, also all of the geolocation information, what projection is it in, what are the extents, the bounds of this data. Um, yeah, quite a little metadata. If I want to access that information, I use this bracket syntax, I say channel one, and it'll give me this x-ray data array object. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but x-rays are becoming a more popular Python library that acts as this all-in-one container for all that metadata, all that geolocation information, all of that band data, all there, easy to access. And the point of this slide is to say, within three to four lines of code, I loaded some, loaded some data from files, and I didn't have to worry about calibration, how the files are read. I didn't have to read the huge, long PDF that explains how ABI data is structured and what it means. Um, that's all in SatPy, and it's doing that all for me. Also, if you have any questions during this, feel free to interrupt me and ask me questions. What's yeah. the file type for this? So for ABI and uh, level 1B, those are NetCDF files. Um, there are, I'll get to it, but there are other formats. So that was kind of my question as well. So for each reader, is there documentation saying where those files come from, what format they're in, and you know, I assume these are like the standard ones that are distributed for the, right. for the ABI. Yeah, so these are the, um, for the ABI level 1B, these are expected to be the PUG, NOAA official level 1B files. Um, yeah, I have a slide later where I go through some of the other readers that are available, and the idea is that if you have some files you want to read, you probably know what format they're in, um, but we have a table in our documentation for this is the name of the reader, these are the files that it can read. Okay, the second question is the file names that list, is that a list of potentially of a file associated with each channel and it's simply pulling those all in and filing them into a single object that has all those channels or mm -hmm. has access to all those channels? It's, it is a list of the individual channel files in this case because that's how ABI level B files are set up. Um, so in this case, if I wanted to look, if I wanted to make all the 16 channels available, I would have a list of 16 items that are each of those individual NetCDF files. And the last question is, if you want to read a data set that's not already provided for by the existing reader types, is it a relatively straightforward process to write your own? Um, there is documentation. It has been followed by new contributors of SatPy successfully. Um, it might come down to your level of experience with Python and what you're comfortable with. But there are many ways to communicate with the core developers and work with us to figure it out. So if we didn't want to work with the channel data, maybe we wanted to make one of those pretty RGBs that I talked about, um, we can take that same scene object that we used before and I can say available composite names. What SatPy is doing here is it's saying based on the data sets that are available, File names that you heard from the files that you gave me. What RGB recipes can I produce? Um, these are built in ones. You can add your own to SatPy if you want. I'll mention that more later. Um, but these are the ones based on having all 16 channels. Here's the ones I can load. On the uh, side of the slide, that's a true color RGB with Rayleigh correction, sharpening technique applied, uh, scaling to bring out clouds, and that kind of thing. Um, when I want to actually load that, I can do that same load call that I did before, but instead of saying channel one, I say true color. That was one of the names in here, and so I can load that here. So SatPy is going, it's figuring out, do I know what this recipe is? Yes. What dependencies do I have? What channels do I need to load? Okay, so I have those channels. What corrections do I need to apply? And it's going through all of this, this whole recipe, figuring out what it needs to do. If I want to resample uh, to a different projection, different resolution, use the scene.resample call. In this case, I'm using a special native resampler, which basically means keep everything in the native projection, the same projection, 
or make them all the same resolution. If you've ever worked with arrays of data, especially something like ABI where you have 500 meter resolution, one pounder resolution, two pounder, you want to combine those arrays. Um, if you want to do simple things like just stack them on top of each other to make an RGB, you have to worry about how each pixel lines up with other pixels. So resampling is helping simplify that. And then if I wanted to save this output to some file format on disk, I can call save data sets on that scene. Uh, by default, that's going to make a geotiff. So that's handling any compression that you want. Uh, you can tile these geotiffs, all that fancy stuff that you might hear about with cloud-optimized geotiffs. Um, that's all possible there. There are other formats that we can write to. But again, the point here is that within a couple lines of code, I didn't have to worry about all of the complexity involved with this. I learned this interface, and I called a few things. And I did all this processing, and if I was working with this data, I get to do what I want to do, not the stuff I don't want to do, which would be calibrating data, worrying about these corrections, and exactly how they're applied. If I, if I know that they're what I want, it's a simple Python call. So I mentioned the other readers. Here's a table of some of the readers in the set file. There's more coming all the time. I combined some of these readers into the same cell because they're similar, and I just didn't have a lot of room on the slide. Some of the key ones, well, I shouldn't say key, some of the newer ones that are kind of fun, um, but all the slide is out of date. AMI is perfectly fine, so that's the Korean satellite. You can read that. Um, AHI, HSD, and HRIT formats, Siberia formats. Uh, if you're familiar with the GeoCat and CollaborX products, you have those. Gridded GLM data, I think this is actually merged and released now, so this is all fine. Modus beers, ABHRR, there's one other one. Pony level 2. Um, so we can use those readers instead of the ABI level 1B level 1B reader that I used before. In addition to the GeoTIFF writer that I talked about, um, if you want to make a CF standard net CDF file, Sakai has a writer for that. Uh, we also have support for this um, a special type of net CDF file that AWIPS understands. So AWIPS is what the National Weather Service forecasters use, it's their visualization client. Um, I wrote a format that AWIPS understands for not just ABI data, which is what this format was originally for, but any data. So any data you have in SAPI that SAPI understands, you can save to this format and put it into AWIPS. Now there might be some configuration stuff and you've got to sign some contracts to get in front, of, in front of forecasters, but this is the first major hurdle to do to get your data in front of forecasters. It's proved that you can get it into a format that AWIPS understands. So on the right here is, this is AHI, it's a true color. I made it with SAPI with data that I had on my laptop, and then uploaded it to an AWIPS workstation on second floor. Um, this wasn't something that AWIPS understood before, but I did it, I did it with SAPI. Other formats, simple images like PNGs and JPEGs, if you work with, um, Certain Canadian orga organizations or other European organizations, they have something called Nino, so we support their Nino TIFF format. There's also another visualization client called Diana that has line TIFFs, so we have support for that. To wrap up section one of this talk, um, we go back to a few lines of Python code, and I've swapped out a few of the arguments. I'm doing something completely different than I was before, where I had ABI data, working with individual channels, making my DBs. Here I'm now taking Beer's SDR files. I've provided the files that I have. I want to make an ASH RGB recipe. I'm going to resample to a different projection, a different resolution. That's all configured, and I did that before. I want to save to that SCMI format instead of GeoTIFFs. And so this is the same interface, just swapping in different parameters. Questions before I move on. Okay. Um, things I'm not going to talk about just because it could take a really long time. Um, except I can do a lot of other stuff besides what I've talked about. I can make a video, so if you want to take time steps of ABI data or some other geostationary satellite, it's an interface for looping through sets of time steps of data and producing a video. You might be used to doing this on the command line. I would say it's equally as good in SAPI. 
Um, if you want to make your own custom RGBs or other types of composites where you're bringing in multiple bands or multiple bands from different satellites, you can do that. Customize how it's enhancing or scaling that data before it's writing into some output format. Do that. Coastlines, logos, timestamps, um, whatever you want to overlay onto your image, there's interfaces for that. Uh, because this is Python, we're using a lot of popular Python libraries, so we are compatible, SatPy is compatible with Cartify, GeoViews, other X-ray plotting tools, um, any other Python tool that you might want to use with your data. It's very likely that it's easy to work with because we're not making our own custom format, we're using the generic tools that are out there that the scientific um, Python ecosystem is using. Lastly, um, SatPy depends heavily on Dask. So Dask is a new, well, new-ish, fancy library for um, easily splitting up the processing you have to do across multiple cores or across a cluster. It does this by taking your huge image array, splitting it up into chunks, and then throwing those at each of these workers that it has. This can make your processing much faster than it normally would be. It can also save memory. So that's the out-of-memory part of this, is Dask can say, um, you only told me to split my work across two workers. I'm only going to work on two chunks at a time. So where you might have code where you always had to lower the resolution because it's just too high of resolution, your computer doesn't have that much memory, Dask can help with that. SatPy uses Dask to do that. Um, load only the chunks that it's working with right now and save your memory. That can also make it faster even if you do have the memory. Okay. So, part two. Um, this is the how. How are people using SatPy right now or in the recent past? Um, these are contributors or users of SatPy. I've um, I talked to them on Slack and noticed how involved they were with the community, so I asked them what they're actually doing with SatPy. So, these are some actual cases. So, Ron Goodson from Environment Canada is creating Beer's total precipitable water deposits where he's adding a border for how old the swap is. So when he views his data in Nino, that's their visualization client, you get an idea of how old each pixel is or each swap. So red borders means it's uh, fairly old, yellow, it's newer, green, it's new, newest. Um, so that forecasters get an idea of whether or not they should trust that data. Simon Proud at the University of Oxford, he uses SAPI to um, feed his retrieval algorithm. So he's reading, uh, I think, severe data, uh, calibrating it, resampling it, giving it to his algorithm. So his algorithm isn't in SatPy, but he's using SatPy to uh, get around the complexity of reading data and doing that calibration. Uh, he then takes that retrieval output, makes these aviation maps, so each white dot is a plane, and everything else on the map is something from his algorithm, and then they have um, used that to tell the pilots where not to fly or where to fly, work on that. Sally Euro from Metsat, among the many things that he does with SatPy, uh, he takes Sibiri data, he's made a natural color RGB, that's what uh, Metsat calls it, and he's overlaid VLD360 lightning model data, and so that's what these orange pixels are on top of the clouds, um, and then he used SatPy to make a video out of it. Jorge Bravo in Mexico. Uh, he doesn't have any antennas at his work like we have a lot on our building. Um, so he's getting data from the NOAA Big Data Project, talking to Google Cloud Services, downloading ABI NetCDF files, using SatPy to make some RGBs, and then he throws them on his JavaScript application so that he can show people um, how the images are changing. Uh, so he has an animation. Um, going on here. Um, as you can see, it's actually moving. He's probing. I, I don't know what the probes are actually doing. I think it's mostly cities, uh, pointing out what cities they are, but he's got a list of various RGBs that he's putting on this display. I am a user of Zapi. I'm also a core developer, but uh, through my work here at the SSCC, I have Two of the main projects that I work on are CSPP GeoGeo to Grid and oops, 
CSVP folder grid. So these are command line tools to wrap all this functionality. So if you aren't a Python programmer, you're not really interested in doing any Python, um, these projects are meant to help you with simple command line interfaces to these features. So in the case of GeoDegrade, working with geostationary data, um, it comes down to one script, geodegrade.sh. Same kind of interface, or same kind of parameters to Sapphire. I say what reader I have, I suppose I should use a later pointer. What writer, what files I have, and then what products I actually want to load. Channel one, true color RGB. Um, GeoDegrade and PolarDegrade have all sets of default, all kinds of defaults to make it so you don't have to worry about those things. It has default, thing, uh, default areas that it will be sampled to, default projections. Um, and other kinds of flags so that it will do things as fast as possible on the most or on, on most machines. Um, simplify that interface. You don't have to do any Python coding if you don't want to. Another project I work on is uh, called SIFT. So um, this is something Jordan Girth started before he left. And uh, this uses, this is a purely Python application. Um, it's also open source. It's a GUI application for viewing and analyzing satellite data where it's using SatPy to read every format that it understands. And then it's using another Python library that I'm a maintainer of called BizPy to view this in an OpenGL canvas. So it's very fast at loading the data and allowing you to probe it, um, make your own RGBs, play with the color limits of those RGBs, that kind of thing. But the point is, SatPy is used for all the reading functions. I think we actually have SIFT installed in 14.11 lab from the student workshops. Yeah. We've had a couple workshops here. Um, Jordan and Scott Lindstrom use SIFT for um, training forecasters on ABI and AHI data. That's how it was originally started. Um, you know, we're kind of growing and adding more features when we can. So those are the use cases, um, but that's not the entire PyTroll or SatPy, the SatPy community. So um, SatPy, like I said, is part of the PyTroll umbrella. It's uh, PyTroll. PyTroll is the community, but it's also what we call the suite of tools that we make. SatPy is one of those. Um, this is a screenshot of the GitHub page, where uh, in the upper right, a star is kind of GitHub's version of a like. So uh, this slide is actually out of date. These numbers are higher than they are in the slide. Um, but, so we have a lot of people who are paying attention to this repository. We have uh, contributions coming in in the form of pull requests. We have uh, 45 unique contributors. I think there's actually like 52-ish now. Um, so it's a growing act active project. Uh, new features are being added all the time. Um, SatPy 0.20 just came out last week, I think. We try to release a new version every month or so. Uh, we also have PyTroll contributor weeks. So this is kind of like a hackathon where anybody who wants to contribute or use these PyTroll tools in their own workflow can come spend a week with the core developers themselves, uh, get help, or just communicate with other people interested in using these tools. The next one is actually split between uh, Norsha in Sweden and Fort Collins, Colorado at CIRA. So May 4th to the 8th. If you're interested in registering for that or joining that, come talk to me or you can Google it. There's a registration form. Yeah. So, otherwise, if you have questions for me now, you can ask them. Here's all of my contact information, the SAPPI code, SAPPI documentation, PyTroll, the group has its own website. We also have a Slack, if you want to come chat to us on that. Uh, we also have a mailing list, if you're more comfortable with that. And we have a four-hour SAPPI tutorial that I made. Um, if a lot of people are interested in doing that, it is possible to walk through by yourself, but if somebody would like me to teach that here in the building, I'm also open to doing that. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. Could you mention uh, what some of the other uh, packages are that are under the PyTroll umbrella? Yeah. So SatPy is one of the high-level ones, meaning it's got the most abstract interfaces, it's, uh, and it uses a lot of the packages underneath. So one of the really important ones is PyResample, so that handles all of the, uh, the geometry definition. So this is my projection, these are my bounds of, of my data. How do I resample that to a different resolution, different projection? That helps you with that. 
uh, there's a package. So PyTroll, the troll comes from, uh, it was started in the Scandinavian countries, and so they tried to give something. Uh, it's not internet troll, it's Scandinavian troll. Um, so a lot of the packages are named after that. So we have troll image. That's a lot of like color map handling and saving to different image formats. Um, there's a package called troll sift just for parsing file names and file name patterns. Um, Pi coast is for adding coastlines. Pi orbital can help you um, get orbit orbital information about where the satellite is currently. So it'll read those TLE files. Those and uh, you can calculate where the satellite is at any given time. And I decorate for adding logos and things. And just yeah. So I've used Dask a lot, and I use the Pangeo stack. I've started Dask a little bit a lot, and not all of them work very well with Dask. So my question is, how smoothly does um, Pisat interface with Dask, and what's the largest data set that you personally? may push through using DAS with that Specifically on something like a cluster or a cloud platform? Whatever. I do not use SatPi very often on a cloud platform. One main reason is that the some of the underlying stuff with Pi Resample does not do well on a cluster because of how it has to be sent between workers. Um, I actually submitted a proposal recently with the Pangeo Group to get funding to make one of the parts of it is to make SatPy and Pi Resample more cloud friendly and also work closely with machine learning algorithms and workflows. Um, I guess it depends what exact issues you had. Um, have. You, if you bring them up to the Pangeo group, there's the chat room for Pangeo. Um, we'd be happy to help. Yeah, the, the issues I've had have been very specific ones related to the supercomputers I've been on. So it's not the kind of thing that developers can okay. well suit it to. Yeah. For instance, with not resampling with Pi Resample, but with XVSMF. Okay. I've run into issues with XVSMF and DAS, depending on which platform I'm on. Uh -huh. um, probably related, same kind of issues you're thinking about right now. Probably similar issues. I know that that package has some assumptions and mm -hmm. Pi Resample specifically was developed for working with satellite data with a lot of pixels. A lot of resampling uh, libraries I found are more in like a couple thousands of pixels. This is in like, we're pretty okay with 10 to 20,000 pixels. Um, so we perform, Pi Resample, excuse me, performs pretty well on like your local machine using a lot of cores on your local machine. Um, the thing I want to do is work on doing that cluster processing, but being smart about how Dask divides up the work. So maybe this worker is desi designated um, only to work on one time step. And so all the data can stay there. Dask doesn't have to send data around. Uh, there's also a lot of um, kind of gotchas with how you handle your Python environments and how those are sent around. Um, there is, so another thing that I don't have listed here is there's an SSCC-dev Slack team or channel, whatever they're called, um, if you want to join that and just talk about programming stuff. So that's all of the programmers in the SSCC. Um, ask for help. Um, otherwise, we just talk about random programming things. There's also a brown bag that I run in the building. Uh, pretty much the first Monday of every month um, where it's somebody telling us what they're working on that's programming centric or we sometimes have how-to tutorial type things. So those are other things that might help get you going on this kind of stuff. So the list of readers that you showed for Sat5, um, I didn't recognize anything that was not a VizIR kind of sensor <laughs> satellite. Is there any plan to support anything outside of that, that category? So microwave, for example? Yes. And yes, um, there are some complications with handling some of that data. Mostly it comes down to how to easily represent that third dimension that you normally have with pressure levels or altitude. Um, there are... Well, that would not necessarily apply to microwave imagery. There wouldn't be any altitude information, per se. Or 
third dimension. Level change. two products, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a reader for new caps, um, which has uh, microwave, I think it processes Chris and ATMS. Um, so there is support for that, at least minimum support. Um, but for level one data is what I'm primarily talking about. I can't think of a microwave level one reader. But I also don't know very many because of the, so a lot of the work I do on SAPI, if it's funded, and I'm not volunteering my time, is for the geodegrid and polar degrid projects, which are focused on making an image. Um, is not answer to, is the answer to my point? Where, where is it? Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, so, answer two. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and I think there's others, I just can't think of them. And it might not be hard to take the one for ANSI 2 and adapt it to say GMI or... Right. Um, the, the, the hardest part is those small little gotchas that are always in like the footer of the PDF where it says, oh, sometimes the fill value is actually a completely different number. And it's, it's all like trying to get that mixed in. But otherwise a lot of this stuff is, is kind of um, kind of been figured out so that it's the same set of functions being used over and over again, just to read files a little differently every time. So level one shouldn't be too bad. It's when we get into level two with pressure and that kind of stuff where things might not be exactly how users want it. But in principle, if you were if you had a reader for a microwave imager and a visit IR imager, you could resample onto a common grid so you could do yes. things that involve both, right? Yes. Which is hard to do if you're coding it up by hand. So I don't have the best example of this, but so this is the actual Git repository for my tutorial that I talked about. Uh, and we'll see if this actually loads. Um, there's actual uh, code in here that takes a beers data set and ABI, and it would be the same for if microwave was involved. Um, okay, so comparing the two and putting them on the same grid. So there's code here for Resample the ABI data. This is kind of small. So resample the ABI data. Resample the beers data. So it's on the ABI grid. You could do the opposite and put the ABI data on the beers swap and do any types of comparisons. There's some like extra code in here to make this perform better, but um, yeah, this is all talked about in the tutorial.